Shabbat Shalom. I spend uh, considerable time with our youth. I meet with them individually and I meet with them collectively as a class. I'm always fascinated by teenagers. One of the reasons that they intrigue me is that they are closer to the beginning than the rest of us. They've only been alive for a brief period of time, long enough to develop some intellectual and behavioral habits that will become permanent, but not long enough to become rigid in their thinking. You can still impact on teenagers. You can still mold them. Through them, you can peer into the human soul and better understand our human composition. In New York City, we see the best of the best. Most of our teenagers are terrific people. They are admirable and even inspirational. They're smart. They're deep thinkers. They're accomplished. They're ambitious. They are good people, sensitive and caring. All of them do mitzvah projects as preparation for the B'nai Mitzvah, and many of them volunteer considerable and even precious time helping those who are less fortunate, whether by volunteering at our own soup kitchen and shelter or various other places around the city. So this week in one of my regular meetings with seven seventh graders, the students described to me their discussion in religious school about vegetarianism. And this led us to discuss their feelings about animal rights. So I tried on, on them a thought experiment that I had heard from some of my colleagues. And I asked our students, if you were on the shore and you saw out in the water a stranger who looked like he was about to drown, and your pet dog that you love, also out in the water about to drown. And you could only save one of them. Who would you save? You know what they told me? Every single seventh grader, every single one, told me that they would save their dog. They would save their dog. And it wasn't even as if they were conflicted about it. They were adamant. I asked why. Their responses were variations on the following theme. I love my dog. I don't know the person in the water. So typical of the times. It is the age of love, right. self-empowerment, feelings. How does it feel? How does it make me feel? We like to validate feelings in youngsters today. I asked our students whether it would make a difference to them if they were the stranger in the water. Would they want the rescuer to rescue them? rather than their pet dog. That stopped them in their tracks. I have nothing against pets. I like dogs. I suspect that as these teenagers grow up, they will develop a strong moral fiber. Perhaps after they take a few college courses, most of them will answer the question the way we would want them to answer the question. At least, that's what I hope. Mark Twain once said about his teenage years, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant that I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> My point is not to argue the self-evident response that a human life takes precedence over the life of an animal. For those of you who would have answered like the teenagers, for those of you before teenagers who would have answered like the teenagers, the rest of my remarks are not for you. But I can suggest to you some remedial reading and some moral training that you might want to consider. My point is to emphasize the importance of learning, the development of humanistic philosophies, and most importantly, not only moral book learning, but the development of the discipline of moral habits, moral routines, and moral outcomes. 
My point is to stress that we need to work hard at moral training as early as possible in life. It's not all about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about using our learning and our skills to appreciate better the purpose of life. What is life about? That's why you have to work hard all the time on your and your children's morality. It's why you need to give to them moral training. If you send your children even to help out in soup kitchens regularly and they have not internalized intellectually that the lives of these fellow human beings that they're helping are precious in their own right and take precedence over the life of a dog, you haven't yet fully instilled in them a mature moral sensitivity. Jews, by the way, believe that most people have it wrong. We believe that inner improvement does not begin with inner thoughts but with outer actions. We think that most people have it in reverse. We do not believe, as most people do, that actions follow beliefs. We conclude the opposite, that in most cases, beliefs follow actions. Good intentions are desirable, but good outcomes are required. A good person is defined not by what she thinks, but by what she does. Piety in Judaism is in performance. Judaism insisted that it is not enough to feel. The true measure of our morality is not in our hearts, but in our deeds. While we are sympathetic to what goes on in your heart, and it's nice if good things are happening there in your heart, we care more about what you do than about what you feel. We need to practice morality, not merely think about it. We need to habituate ourselves daily to moral training and train ourselves daily for moral discipline. In the real world, by the way, it's not altruism, but duty and habit that motivate most people. The word mitzvah in Hebrew doesn't simply mean a good deed, but describes obligation, commandment, a sense of duty. And thus, for example, we don't even have a word in Hebrew that defines charity in a manner that is commonly understood, grace. Tzedakah in Hebrew means justice. You have an obligation to support the poor. It is the law of moral behavior. And even if you do not understand it, do it anyway. Perhaps over time you will come to understand. This is the faith that we seek to instill. It is faith in other human beings. It is the faith that recognizes, contrary to some contemporary theories, that I am not the center of the moral universe. A long-suffering wife confided to a good friend, my husband has changed his faith. He no longer believes he's God. <laughs> this is the key religious sentiment. The world is much bigger than me. And human beings are the pinnacle of all creation. In this week's Torah portion, Vayigash, we read of the climax of the story of Joseph and his brothers, and in many ways, the climax of the book of Genesis. Joseph was a 17-year-old teenager when he was abandoned by his brothers and sold into slavery. It is evident that when he meets his brothers in this week's Parsha, some 20-odd years later, he still harbors enormous resentment. Joseph is still trapped by his teenage experiences. And as in so many other teenagers throughout the ages, back then, for Joseph, when he was a teenager, it was all about him. He strutted around in his technicolor dream code, arrogant and self-absorbed. And when he sees his brothers again, you get the impression that initially it was still all about him. He toys with his brothers repeatedly, not revealing his true identity, selling, sending them back and forth to the land of Israel. But when Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers, he's around 30, 39 years old, he says, I am your brother Joseph, 
Do not be distressed or reproach yourselves because you sold me here. Ki lemichya shalachani Elohim lifnechem. God has sent me here ahead of you to save life. This is the key thought. Joseph now recognizes that human life is not only about him. Life is not only about feelings. Joseph overcame his strong feelings of resentment. And what moves Joseph now deeply, he bursts into tears, is the new recognition that his life serves a broader purpose. His life is about saving life. His life is about others. His life is about taking responsibility. All of his mathematical genius, all of his administrative genius, all of his political genius, his overwhelmingly powerful intuition that allows him to read people's inmost thoughts, these are tools in the arsenal of improving the lives of others, of saving life. Our highest humanity always leads to someone or something other than ourselves. The more we actualize our humanity, the more we are led to serving others, helping others, loving others, believing in others. Our most inspirational moments are when someone helps us to peer into our own nature and to intuit the moral sentiment that lies at the core of the, the human being. Our most meaningful moments are when we are able to say, my life is worth more than a dog's life. His life is worth more than a dog's life. God has sent me here. I have a purpose. I have been placed on this earth for greater purposes beyond me. To save life. To value human life above all else. And to improve the lives of others. Amen.